is great deforest. So the news today uh, is that for the first time we've been able to image a coronal mass ejection uh, with lots of detail and the photometric quality all the way through its entire life cycle from the inside of the solar corona until it impacted the Earth three days and 93 million miles later. Uh, now this was enabled by new processing methods that were applied to archival data from the International Second Instrument on board Stereo. So, uh, I'd like to introduce a, a movie of the science. We've combined five separate cameras views into one frame. And I'll just give you the, the movie to start with. So if we could roll the science movie here. On the right side of the frame, you see the lower solar corona, and you'll see a coronal mass ejection form down the corona and be launched into space, crossing the entire solar system until it becomes a 50 million mile high wall of plasma about to envelop the Earth. Now for a sense of scale, the Earth on your screen would be microscopic. We've actually drawn a little icon on there because you wouldn't be able to see it otherwise. The scale of these, these events is simply immense. Uh, for the first time, we're able to actually track through these outer regions of the, of the image here on the left-hand side in black and white uh, as the structure evolves and distorts before impact. Uh, so for 40 years or more, we've understood that the sun occasionally hurls billion ton clouds of material at one to three million miles an hour into interplanetary space. When those clouds impact the Earth, they cause space weather effects that affect our technology, uh, cause auroras, that sort of thing. Uh, but until now, we couldn't see any detail in these structures after about 10 degrees from the sun. And the result is that everything uh, outside of that has been extrapolation. So we've been unable to connect the very detailed structures we see at the Earth back to the solar structures that gave rise to them in the first place. Uh, but now, uh, we can identify which parts of the CME came from the sun and which parts were swept up from the solar wind in its path. We can see how the CME is modified as it propagates and grows across the solar system. Uh, and we can get a first look at how the magnetic structure that drives the CME changes and evolves as it pushes the bright material in front of it, sweeping up solar wind to impact uh, the planets or spacecraft that sample it. Uh, so to track CMEs, we've been mentioning uh, there are five cameras that we have to combine, and they have vastly different scales. So I'd like to show you what we did to prepare these images so you can see them. Uh, we had, if we could roll the zoom movie, please. We begin with an ultraviolet telescope image of the sun. We zoom out until we can see Venus and the Earth more than 45 degrees away from the sun. However, we can't see the corona. So we've distorted the coordinate system into radial coordinates, which allows us to see the entire system in one screen. Uh, the, the scale changes drastically from the right to the left. On the right-hand side, we have the sun. On the left-hand side, we're looking at whole planets uh, and, the, and the distances between them. Uh, now, the outer cameras, the outer four cameras in that field of view, uh, the sepia tone and the black and white measure ordinary sunlight that's been scattered off of free electrons in the plasma clouds in the, in the solar system. Uh, close to the sun, that, that light is easy to measure. It's relatively bright compared to the stars. But by the time the cloud reaches Venus, it's 10 billion times fainter than the surface of the full moon. It's about a thousand times fainter than the galaxy or the star field in deep space behind the images. So it was a tremendous achievement to separate the two signals. It's very difficult to separate the, the signal from the clouds from the star field that's superimposed upon it. Uh, it. It's a testament to the quality of the instruments from NRL and the Rutherford Labs that we're able to drill this far into the data and actually find something there at the bottom. Uh, so moving back to the science, let's review the data uh, that I showed you at the beginning in slower motion. Now, pay close attention, not just to the bright front as it sweeps across, but to the dark void behind it. And I'll narrate as we run the gauge movie here. Uh, so again, we'll see the event form in the lower corona. It's visible in the ultraviolet. Uh, and we'll see it propagate through the brown-toned lower corona and out into the heliosphere, growing and distorting as it moves. You can see the, uh, the dark region behind the front is full of magnetic field, and that's what's driving the event. Uh, as it picks up material from the surrounding solar wind and gains brightness in front, the magnetic field, the magnetic flux rope that's doing the pushing distorts. 
When the whole event hits the Earth, the wind gauge pegs at 20 atoms per cubic centimeter and then returns back to normal levels, uh, indicating that, in fact, we are measuring the appropriate thing. That gauge is driven by in situ measurements from NASA's wind spacecraft that was actually at the Earth and detecting the, this event as it went by. Uh, so, to sum up, uh, we have the, for the first time, we've tracked a complete CME life cycle from the interior of the corona out to the, to the Earth. Uh, this was achieved by reprocessing existing data from really stunningly high quality uh, uh, archives from stereo. And uh, this should give us new insights into how solar storms evolve and connect the events that we can measure at the Earth back to their solar origins. With that, for more context, I'll hand you over to Dave Webb.